Um, welcome everybody to this um, our, our latest weekly 11 a.m. on a Thursday webinar series. Um, it's been, been going incredibly well um, and it's been um, great to run a series of data-driven um, webinar events. I'm delighted to, be able to introduce Jordan Mitchell and Sam Tingler from um, IV Tech Lab. Introduce what's happening with REARC and an explainer of Privacy Sandbox. So uh, please take it away, Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay. I think I'm good to go. Hi, my name is Jordan Mitchell. Uh, I'm head of identity, data, and privacy over at uh, IAB Tech Lab. Uh, and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it is evening here in Seattle for both uh, Seattle, Washington, and USA for both Sam and I. Uh, and we're very pleased to uh, to be coming at you today and answering any questions you have and, and hopefully providing some, some education here. What I'm uh, going to talk about is a little bit about Project REARC. I'm going to assume that you already know a bit about IAB Tech Lab, uh, thanks to our, our good friends at IAB Australia, uh, and, uh, and that you already know a little bit about Project uh, REARC, but I'll give you a refresher course and then, and then jump into an update of, of kind of where we are uh, and where we're going with this uh, as, as, as we... Uh, as we go forward here. So uh, as a refresher, uh, I, identifiers and addressability, um, and, and, uh, and particularly when it comes to third-party vendors, uh, is, is very much uh, at the core of all ad-supported use cases, uh, from reach and frequency capping to audience targeting, uh, both on, on all kinds of different devices. Uh, we have uh, 26 years of software that runs our ecosystem in the buying and selling of, of digital media and advertising um, in and around uh, identifiers. Uh, starting a couple years ago with Safari ITP and then much more recently at a rapid pace, uh, browsers uh, have been blocking tracking third-party cookies in the name of privacy. All of these efforts, and we've, talked, we've spoken directly with the browsers, all of these efforts are focused on reducing cross-site tracking uh, at scale. So where does that leave us when we have the one-to-one uh, uh, -one addressability and identifiers and third-party cookies as the core of so many of the, of the use cases that we rely on? It pretty much means that all the ad tech systems supporting uh, uh, buyers and sellers, uh, uh, that bridge from first to third party of any sort um, is being blown up, and a lot of these systems and software is going to need to be retooled over the next 18 months. It affects a lot of, there's a lot of dependencies in the software and, and the, the business activities that we have in the, in the technology use cases. We have to recognize that it's between consumers and the brands that they trust now. Uh, as consumers, uh, we all have different tolerances for uh, privacy and personalization. Some of us don't want any tracking whatsoever. Uh, for some, they want the ultimate and personalization and conveniences that uh, that tracking enables. And then there's a lot of folks, um, uh, including on this call, that want a, a blend of, of both. So REARC was really a mission to, okay, it, while third-party cookies and then subsequently uh, we think it, well, this will happen within all other uh, environments uh, where tracking is possible, uh, the mobile uh, ad ecosystem, or the mobile app ecosystem, uh, connected TV devices, et cetera. Uh, it's really important that we take this opportunity uh, to harmonize what does it mean between privacy and personalization and safety for the end consumer. So we're engaging stakeholders globally to rethink and re-architect digital marketing uh, in a privacy by uh, design sort of way with alternatives that support some of the key objectives that, that I don't think anyone can disagree with um, some of those are, uh, uh, are here. Just as what's being taken from here and what's being uh, the technology changes that are getting us to this point involve tech standards, the HTTP cookie is a tech standard from W3C. Um, uh, the components that we need to focus on will be tech standards and guidelines for how we solve this. We don't believe it is a single identity product or service. Uh, and, but we also believe that industry accountability mechanisms are going to be critical for any form of addressability going forward. 
uh, accountability uh, for first parties and the third parties that they trust is going to be critical going forward. Uh, so what we have seen is that, like I said, 25 plus years of what we sort of call tracking by default, and that's to borrow a phrase from uh, the, uh, those within the, the privacy engineering capacity, where everyone has access to data, everyone can set cookies, everyone has access to identifiers. Uh, the, it's completely steering in the other direction to where uh, the actions that we're seeing and the conversations we're seeing within the browser OS platforms now are eliminating identifiers for third parties altogether and even going so far as to look at first party identifiers uh, as well. In this case, in this privacy by default case, uh, uh, you can really only rely on uh, contextual at that point. There are discussions of Privacy Sandbox, and Sam's going to provide some more information on this. It really means focusing on device, so decisioning on the device, the data stored on the device, uh, measurement occurs on device, um, even audience segmentation is, is done um, on the device as well. However, first parties still have uh, an opportunity here. They still hold first party data, whether it is uh, demographic data or behavioral data that they capture or CRM or, 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 or e-commerce uh, data, so they have customers and they have customer data that they, that they can draw from, um, as, as well as authenticated data. Some are going for logins, some are going for email-based logins. All of this is a way for first parties to identify sets, and now it just means, okay, well, how do we, how do we utilize that when that bridge to third parties is being, um, is being messed with? So this is where standards come in, and, and Tech Lab focuses on indus industry standards globally, um, uh, a lot of, like lots of different industry standards. Well, this is, this is where we come into play here, and, and this is where we have to come together as an industry and figure out where those standards exist to fuel the innovation that, that, that we all want as companies to, to innovate and move forward for consumer experiences. Within the non-addressable front, we, of course, have a content taxonomy, uh, and uh, for standardized ways for uh, publishers to describe the context um, in, uh, of the page of their app, and that provides uh, scale for buying. Within the privacy sandbox and a lot of these proposals that are being teased out now, we're really engaging on that front and encouraging cross-platform consistency. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get it, but we're really looking to W3C to say, look, you know, HTTP, a lot, the web was built on open standards. Let's make sure we keep that going forward so we don't have every browser and OS platform doing things slightly differently. It makes it very difficult uh, for us to see an open web uh, world that, that we all uh, believe in. And then on the first party data front, we have an audience taxonomy that we already offer in place for standardized ways in which uh, brands and publishers at their option can describe their audiences the same uh, for scale in buying and selling, uh, data labeling standards uh, so that we have transparency around how a given audience segment was defined, um, sort of think of it in terms of a nutritional label uh, for audience data, like the similar you see at products in a grocery store. Uh, again, open RTV guidance and standards for authenticating users, uh, uh, consumers, and the tech standards for that. Across all of these uh, privacy by default uh, 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 areas or these uh, scenarios. We're really looking at establishing best practices, uh, tech standards where appropriate, guidelines where appropriate, and we're looking at across web, mobile, CTV, and cross, and, and cross device as well um, for, for all of this. On the authenticated consumer front, we think this is an important area. Uh, all, all companies that have direct customers, consumers as, as customers, um, have that, con that customer data um, that they can ask for or they can get in, in different ways. And we really want to enable that within a secure, trusted supply chain where everyone feels comfortable executing in that. And what that means is, is as a consumer, if I provide uh, my data, um, and I willingly, like within a, a, a transaction, or even if I just provide an email address in, in exchange for access to content, um, with a, uh, well, let's just say on the buy, on the, the marketer side, if I engage with a brand and I trust the brand and I provide them with something about myself, 
and then I go on the within a trusted publisher, uh, and I'd like to connect those two, and I provide the same information either via login or an email address, or there's any number of ways this could happen uh, to a, a, a trusted publisher. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can enable privacy and accountability within that within that supply chain and trust in that in that supply chain. And what that means is we want to allow third parties to execute on behalf of their customers without enabling all the third party tracking that uh, the browser and OS platforms are trying to protect. Um, and of course, that limits we clearly limits the, the data leakage that. Uh, uh, brands and publishers so desperately want. They want to limit the leakage of that data to only parties that they authorize within the terms that they authorize. And the same with, with, with consumers. Now, this is an area where global stakeholder input is very critical, and it's not just on the tech folks that, that Tech Lab normally works with, but the business folks, the policy folks. These, this is a three-legged stool where the bridges between these constituents are, can be difficult to cross. If you've worked within your company and you're in a business person talking to an engineer, talking to a, a policy person, you know that those bridges are difficult. Well, we have to form those bridges. We have to all work together on this. And so we've, uh, we've formed a, a task force to coordinate and provide inputs across all of these different groups' efforts uh, because we recognize and, and, and encourage other organizations to get behind this effort, form committees, form working groups. Uh, and, and, and we've indeed been, been quite successful in doing that. And that, that provides uh, the technology folks between our whole industry, uh, it really provides the necessary inputs for how we can design tech standards and solutions that fuel that innovation uh, that, that, we, that we really want. So the collaboration, we have a, a Tech Lab has a member only addressability working group and a member only accountability working group. This is where the product and engineering folks huddle to define standards for addressability solutions across those different privacy by default scenarios. And then the accountability, uh, we're not going to get real addressability uh, going forward without accountability. That is, doing what we say and saying what we do and being, being able to prove it. So the accountability working group will be focusing on building those accountability programs and most importantly those technical mechanisms that ensure adherence not only to the privacy uh, settings of a consumer but the addressability standards from above and of course the task force. Um, and then we've got a lot of the national regional IEDs and other organizations um, who are forming those own their own groups and coordinating with us and, and we love that. Um, the, the process here is really focused on, first we've got to understand the problem. Let's make sure we go through all the business activities from the sell side and buy side, which is the two perspectives that everyone can easily understand, either you're a publisher or you're a brand. And these are the activities and the business models of those two core uh, uh, stakeholders. And here's where there's identif identifier dependencies. And here's what happens when you remove those uh, identifiers. Uh, at that point, we'll be armed, and then we'll have some uh, some some sort of uh, uh, encapsulating sort of the privacy principles from the browsers, and use that uh, to understand in, in phase two uh, how each of these technical alternatives uh, weigh in. We will we will be looking at a, a, a core set of technology alternatives for how we solve this. We're not going to be thinking in terms of specific companies because there's lots of different companies. What we're going to focus is on overall generalized technology approaches because it's, it's in all of our best interests if in this, in this sea of different solutions that we distinguish between the solutions that are looking for a problem, the solutions that don't, won't have any feasibility going forward with the way regulation and browser changes are going forward, and the solutions that are the ones that have real feasibility going forward, and there are many of those as well. We're not going to pick the winners and losers there, but we'll, tell, we'll, we'll have an opinion within the phase one problem space of here's how the different alternatives measure up against these, this evaluation criteria. And then that should surface what is the right approach for our industry going forward. At that point, we come together um, around standards, uh, including accountability mechanisms to support those technology approaches going forward and give a platform for all companies to move forward from. 
uh, from a timeline perspective, we're really focused on uh, no later than next, this time next year, we need to see a significant shift in media spend towards some of these new addressability mechanisms. Working backwards from there, uh, we're focused on uh, phase one uh, this quarter uh, and phase two in Q3 uh, and phase three in Q4. By then, we hope to draft some of the standards and even get um, a lot of the uh, participants engineering new addressability mechanisms into their core technology plat um, platforms for release and for usage and for beta, uh, beta uh, uh, usage, uh, et cetera. And now, uh, what I'll do is I'll go into sort of a status report on where we are with phase one since we, we started uh, just about five weeks ago. Um, we've got 437 people on the task force, uh, you know, mid 180s, so involved in the member only working groups. We've had a, few, a couple meetings of each of those. We have work in progress focusing on phase one deliverables there. Uh, in terms of overall industry trade orgs who are going forward both with us and within their own uh, organizations, including uh, IB Australia, who, who's, who's hosting the, the critical conversations there locally with local players. Uh, that's, that's very, very important. And so they're involved. In, in, uh, we got 14, uh, actually more, I think, of national regional IVs involved, other trade orgs, uh, more coming online, um, uh, including a lot of the buy side trade orgs um, are really jumping in uh, now. Now what I thought I'd do is just quickly review some of the phase one uh, documentation uh, and kind of walk you through this. This is sort of a project plan table of contents uh, and then with the, the jumping off points to the deliverables and the current status. And uh, uh, we provide a status report on these business activities and the business on the publisher side and the marketer side uh, on that. And, we and we're really focused on getting these done. I'd like to be farther along um, if I'm honest. Uh, let's look at the publisher business overview. This is just a table of contents, but we go over the publisher business model and their core activities, which is develop content service, acquire users, readers, et cetera, personalize and deliver, monetize, you know, yield optimization, et cetera, and then re-engage with those. And then that's sort of high level. Then we go into, for each of these, like monetization, personalization, delivery, we're focusing on the specific business activities. What does that mean and where are the dependencies on identifiers? Um, and we go to that level of detail because as we evaluate solutions, we need to highlight, okay, a solution will work for, uh, for example, it would work for affiliate links, but it would not work for direct sales. And, I'm, and I'm, that's not a real case, but we need to understand with that level of granular, granularity what is going to work in this, these different uh, situations. And we do so on the marketer side as well. So this is going to be a pretty broad document with, with high level and, and deep level of, uh, of the core business activities as well as the very distinct business activities and how each of those are affected when you remove identifiers. Um, uh, let me just uh, kind of go down to a little bit here. Well, I won't go too much into this, but I invite you all to take a look at this uh, and uh, get involved. We need authors to run through this. After authoring, we're going to need uh, we're going to need reviewers, uh, and that should be coordinated uh, within your local IV office there with JJ and and, and others. Uh, and uh, and then I think that's uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically stop right there. Uh, my 15 minutes is up. I hope that was helpful. We can come back for questions after uh, towards the end. I think uh, as we're, we're going. And and with that, I invite uh, Sam to tell us uh, a bit about Privacy Sandbox. Um, and whatever else he has up his sleeve. Okay, thank you, Jordan. <clears throat> I hope uh, my screen share is now working. Um, we're, we, I, I'm asked today to speak on Privacy Sandbox, but I, Privacy Sandbox kind of exists within a broader context, and it's important to understand that, that broader context. Oh, it, it's difficult to to operate and and manage and release a modern browser these days. Browsers are hideously complex in everything that they have to do, 
the, the core task of a browser is kind of to, to render arbitrary code all over the internet without allowing that arbitrary code to do naughty things on your device. And that, that's difficult given that there's lots of dollars behind breaking through that sandbox. So every modern at scale browser has a, a parent of some kind that actually pays the bills because browsers do not pay the bills. And whether it's Safari, Chrome, Firefox, they, they all have a, a corporate parent somewhere behind the scenes, which is responsible for actually funding operations. And the, who that parent is and, and what their motivations are um, affects how browsers behave and what their positioning is like to, to varying degrees. Um, each, each of those organizations has a, a different model for kind of how they firewall off the browser team from everybody else. Um, but that, that's its own topic as well. But right now, we, within the browsers, it's the privacy advocates and the engineers who, who are in the driver's seat. Uh, they are setting the agenda. Um, in almost all cases, for Firefox and Brave in particular, uh, for them, privacy is a, a marketing position. And it, it's sort of fundamental to what they are and what they do. I, with Safari as well, they, it's a similar situation. Um, it, and as a result, I, I think Chrome is pushed into acting on privacy. Um, it, we, we have heard from time to time, a, a question, you know, wait, why don't we just have an ID for advertising? Um, the, to be clear, they, that is not going to happen. Virtually none of the browsers will, would see that as an acceptable outcome. But like Jordan said, we, we have had conversations with almost all of them in private and in public. And they, there's, there's effectively no universe in which a, a device or user ID for, for advertising purposes exists within the browser. Looking back at, at the recent past on browser activity related to privacy, I, I think Safari really kicked off what's happening right now. It kicked off this moment, going back to 2017 and even farther before that. But I, I, as of now, all three and even four counting edge major browsers have publicly, publicly released a privacy positioning of some kind that, that defines the principles and the practices that they plan to allow and that they plan to discourage or fight. They, they have all taken a strong stance against third party cookies. Chrome was virtually the last to do so. And in their, their relative positioning, Chrome is, is unique in the degree to which they have uh, endorsed or um, publicly espoused the, the value of advertising as a web content model, as a web funding model, and in particular, the, the value of audience-based advertising. Um, no, Safari, Firefox, and, and Edge, none of the other browsers have to any degree stated public support for audience-based advertising. And again, you know, you can speculate as to whether or not that, that comes back to their corporate parent. But it, that reflects their privacy activities now in that Chrome a Privacy Sandbox both takes things away in that they've said that third party cookies will be going away sometime in 2022, as well as uh, Privacy Sandbox can consists of introducing new capabilities. And other browsers have not voiced any degree of support or very little support behind introducing new capabilities to fulfill the use cases that third party cookies going away have removed. So the, these browsers, they, they all for various reasons wish to engage in conversations around privacy, largely in public. And we, we talk about W3C as a, a single unit, but there's really three relevant groups within W3C. The privacy sandbox group 
or the privacy sandbox conversation has largely happened within the what they call the improving web advertising business group as a part of W3C. The path, the like implicit path within that group right now is just progression on privacy sandbox. Further defining the specifications, whether they come from Chrome or, or from others within the community, just iterating on those specifications and trying to identify and meet the use cases that the advertising and publishing ecosystem depends on today. Privacy Sandbox um, takes things away and introduces new capabilities. Some of the things going away are things like third party cookies, IP address, um, detailed user agent strings, uh, device orientation, whether it's horizontal or vertical, um, and other fingerprinting surface areas. The, there's new capabilities that are introduced sort of use case by use case. As the, the ecosystem or Chrome we themselves identify a use case, it's discussed and a, an attempt is made to understand it on the Chrome side. And then a, a proposal put out to fulfill that use case in a way that meets their privacy preserving policies. As of earlier this year, and I, I think the situation is not that different today, there are specifications to meet use cases, mostly in these four categories, measurement, relevance, fraud detection, and anti-fingerprinting, where the, the first three are, are really introducing new capabilities and that the last, anti-fingerprinting, is taking away existing capability. And I, I'll go through a couple of these. Um, one of the most important, I think, is privacy budget, which is a, around how publishers and third parties access detailed user level or device level information, which would be consistent across publisher sites. Whether it is the screen, si screen resolution or IP address or any, any information like that, which is going to be the same across different web domains, the privacy budget says that a given site only has so many privacy dollars to spend to access that information. So if a, a site or third parties are interested in IP address and user agent data, then they may not be able to access other pieces of information. Willful IP blindness is also one of the mo most important parts of that privacy budget. It, it defines a way in which publishers and third parties could declare that they don't care about IP address data. And then they, there's a process spec'd out for auditing in which a, a service which says, I, I don't need IP data can certify itself as not actually looking at or recording or making available IP address data. And the, the presence of that certification and the presence of, of that um, proactive declaration allows for additional privacy budget information to be consumed. Client hints takes away the large uh, sort of mysterious user agent string that this is a core part of the web in which every browser sends information to say, um, this is a Mac device running Chrome version 82 on a, a with such and such minor version number. But that data is going away and to be replaced by more detailed uh, specific information, like that the browser is Chrome, not the entire string. There's a proposal for aggregated reporting in which the browser, the browser and sort of mysterious black box services operated by the owner of the browser receive impression reports. Impressions or campaigns are registered within the browser and the browser records data against that. 
sends it somewhere and the owner of the campaign receives aggregated reporting API to provide reach and um, other statistically important information to the campaign owner without impression level information, without identifying the actual unique devices observing each ad. There's a specification called Flock for interest-based audiences. This is one in which the browser itself observes sites and pages that a user visits and collects similar users into the same flock cohort. And then the browser sends sort of a cohort ID to like, on each web request. And that cohort ID is, is guaranteed by the browser to not represent, to represent an audience of a particular size. Uh, I think they're saying at least 1,000 people. So each device is classified into some flock which represents its behavior. That ID is not, uh, it's not an index into a taxonomy like the IV content taxonomy. What it is, is up for some service to decide. But you can imagine that, that services will spring up to match these flock keys into content or audience taxonomies. There's another proposal called Turtle Dove for detailed retargeting. Now, this is one in which an advertiser can register with the browser. This device is interested in product X, and I would like to retarget this device at some point later on a different site. Then the, the browser has some magic to allow for a retargeting event on a different site against that same product without the advertiser being able to uniquely identify the device itself. So there, there's some on-device auction and on-device ad selection to allow the ad to run at a, a later point after the, the original retargeting page view. So there's a number of other specifications that are part of Privacy Sandbox. They're all interesting and uh, not really, not super difficult to read and I encourage this group to read them. And we're happy to take questions at this time. Thank you so much, Sam. Fantastic. Thank you, Jordan and Sam, um, who will also be part of this Q&A and, and available for questions. So I now hand over to Dan Richardson to take it away with the Q&A, please. Morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Uh, so for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes or so, we're going to have a, a discussion which uh, leads on from uh, what Jordan and Sam have shared. Uh, two big points I took from Sam's Prezzo was that uh, browsers are uh, hideously complex. So hopefully we can simplify that a little bit for people uh, in, in the next um, panel. Uh, and also everyone, uh, needs a, uh, everyone needs a sugar daddy. We'll see what that actually means. Um, but yeah, great presentation, Sam. And it's all available to watch again because uh, we're recording and there's some great IAB explainers on the sandbox as well. But today's panel, um, um, we're going to start off uh, with... Um, myself, I co-chair the Data Council for Australia and work at Verizon. Um, we're very pleased to be joined by uh, Adele Weiser, who's the Regional Managing Director uh, at Index Exchange, Stuart Parnaby, um, National, Managing, uh, National Marketing Manager at Genesis Motors Australia, and also Rashida Murray, who heads up performance at Spark Foundry. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Yeah. Yep, I can hear you, Adele. Excellent. Okay, so we know that identity informs basically every step of the ad buying stage, uh, whether it's budgets, KPIs, targeting, optimization, uh, measurement. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there. Uh, what are the most practical uh, ramifications of these forthcoming changes for, for brands, really? And 
we, we want to get to a starting point. Um, and and you know, what is worrying brands the most? Um, I'm going to throw it to, to Stuart uh, to answer this first, as someone who's leading one of the, the biggest automotive brands uh, in Australia. Stuart, what's, what currently is worrying, um, worrying yourself the most about all of these changes? Uh... Well, well, I should say thanks for calling us one of the biggest automotive brands in, in Australia there, Dan. Um, for those who don't know, Genesis is part of the Hyundai group, which is what makes us large. But as a brand, we're, we're very new and very small. Um, so, hey, go buy Genesis. But um, uh, the thing that's worrying sort of brand marketers, uh, or at least from my point of view, is that, you know, the push to you know, cookie data and targeting and identity and, and all, all the jargon and buzzwords that we want to throw around was a promise of, you know, right message, right time, right audience, um, some some promise of optimization, of, of, of improved ROI, of improved conversion. Uh, and I guess you hear about the changes and you say, well, has that been taken away from me? Because that's that's a world that I've, I've been sold on. And, um, and I suppose to sort of briefly say something more personal, my my use of identity is around trying to know that I've gotten my bundle of messages to a given user um, to push them down the line. People try and make a, a journey to purchase very linear. Um, the metaphor I use is it's more like a bingo card and once they've collected all the little bits of information that they like, they yell bingo and they buy my product. Um, you know, many tens of thousands of dollars on a, on a car is a very high involvement purchase. So to try and make it an A to B line is silly. So I'm, I'm constantly challenging my agencies, my publishers, you know, all my partners to say, well, you show me the user that's got box one, two and five ticked and let's show them the piece of information that's in box three and box four. And, and I guess my fear is that that's been taken away from me. And, and you know, that's a little scary because that's my skill set and that's my, that's my whole strategy there. And I think um, box one and two might still be preserved around uh, post-click activity. Uh, so we're obviously um, media is far more omnichannel than that. Um, so good luck with your bingo card. Um, I think that's a great analogy. And um, we're, we're actually going to um, switch now to the agency point of view because we know that access to, to data can be vast and varied depending on the client. Um, Rashida, from a, an agency perspective, you know, where are you dedicating your efforts right now to solve for you know, what is a quite uncertain future? classic Zoom mute mistake. Um, it is quite an uncertain mistake. And I think from an agency perspective, it's about navigating what it means for different brands. And it means very different things to different brands. So we work with automotive brands where, uh, I mean, data collection was a, was a challenge to begin with because the experience and the involvement in the purchase is so long and there are so many touch points and a lot of those touch points are not digital to working with FMCG brands where they have very little data about their customers and then brands that are basically built online and built with data and it kind of means something slightly different with them. In terms of where we're dedicating our efforts as, a, as an agency group, um, I, think, um, I think we talked earlier when we talked about the project REARC about re the need to retool and relook at technology. And as a group, we've invested nearly $4 billion last year in uh, acquisition of a technology company. And I think we're really investing heavily in um, strengthening our ID graph solution because that's going to be really critical for a lot of our clients and building ID solutions that are not so reliant upon cookie data where that's made our life a lot easier over the last few years. We need to kind of consolidate and, and bring more rigor and more sources of data to, um, to paint a different picture of our customers. And we're focusing more on strategic audiences rather than one-to-one -one connections. So one-to-one -one connections where I know I'm talking to Rashida and this is exactly what she needs to see is, is probably going to be a little bit of a challenge for a, a certain group of the advertisers that we work with. So we start to talk a little bit more about, okay, well, what do we know about these strategic audiences? Where do they live? What do they know about the people that live in these type of postcodes? How do we enrich that data? And those strategic audiences might be quite granular, but it'll still be a few thousand people in each of those. 
And then we kind of look at also other types of strategies. So I know um, a lot of the time I talk to people and, and they tell me, oh, are we going to have to go back? Are we going to go back to contextual targeting? And we're going to go back to keyword targeting. And I think for us, it's really important that we're not going backwards, we're going forwards. And how has contextual targeting changed over the last couple of years? And what's the opportunity in native? And what's the opportunity amongst the media mix to have really relevant brand messages in the right context, talking to a strategic audience. Thanks, Rashida. I like your point around not going backwards. I think whilst the channel might still be the same, the creative has, has really evolved um, as well. And also your point about uh, building one-to-one -one, uh, relationships. We want to separate between uh, building a high level of identity resolution, which is, is, is essentially built on that that one-to-one -one knowledge of a person versus one-to-one -one targeted ads. Um, and that's, that's a key differentiation. Um, I'd like to get a point of view from the, uh, the ad exchange side, uh, Adele. Now I've, I've been having a little look at your, your website and your, your um, goal there is to democratize digital advertising and to make things simple. So uh, some big goals set uh, given all of the, uh, the, the changes that are uh, happening now. Where, where are you focusing your efforts to, to solve that problem for people who are um, both uh, putting inventory into the exchange and then mm -hmm. buying from it? On the demand side, yeah, it's a it's definitely a big uh, audacious goal. But you know, I think in the last couple of years and the way that the industry is moving forward, we are starting to see you know a lot of uh, traction there, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, you know, when we talk to like the democratization, it's really about that like enablement across the full value chain and ensuring that each of the key players from all the way to, from the advertiser side to the end user of a publisher has that sort of like understanding and trust fundamentally. Uh, and when that sort of is bridged through, you know, the steps that we as an exchange are taking in the space to help bring that trust and bring that that collaborative nature to the ecosystem is sort of where we're focused. But I guess from the identity point of view, you know, we we sort of, we've been working towards, um, a, you know, a number of solutions over the last few years that have really started to bridge the, 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 the gap that I guess we have had in terms of addressability uh, within within our space. So uh, no two publishers of ours are, are the same in terms of the data or the audiences or even the inventory that they sit upon. So when we as an exchange are looking for, you know, how do we help build towards our future and, and what this is going to look like when the cookie third party cookie, I should be very explicitly clear, does go away. Um, you know, we want to build this like identity framework that has the ability to enable, you know, solutions and, and, and options for publishers to look at like, what is the best fit? Working collaboratively hand in hand with the buyers like agencies and, and advertisers, you know, they can pick and choose the multiple solutions to plug in and play with. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's our focus for the initial stage. But I think I wanna just take a step back and, and sort of define identity because it is one of those like really broad terms. And I know I've been living and breathing it for three years plus. Uh, so for me, this is second hat and I, don't, I do tend to throw it around um, just in, in conversation without properly defining it. So from Index's point of view, you know, an identity solution is something that either looks to consolidate legacy cookie-based um, identifiers or unlocking the real-time people-based um, methodologies that are, that are coming into play in this current state of the world. Thanks, Adele. And I think on the, uh, look, on the publisher side, we know that, uh, that there isn't one identity ring to rule them all. In fact, publishers are testing multiple identity solutions right now to see Indeed. what gets them the, the best yield and, and fill rates and ACPMs. But look, on the advertiser side, I think that there's still that a little bit of a misconception that you, you, you can reach this, this single view. Um, I'm going to uh, throw the question now, uh, firstly, to, uh, to Stuart. Um, is, is a single customer view uh, possible at all, uh, and, and particularly within your vertical or how well can you actually know your customers? Uh, well, uh, there's the professional opinion and the personal one. I'm a cynical person by nature. I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think what we should all do is aim for it. Um, look, whether, whether or not it can ever be truly unified, I don't, I don't think it ever will, because any time we get towards it, someone's going to stand in the way. But I, I certainly think that the direction towards it is the way we still go. Um, as customers move down our, you know, whether you say final journey, you know, pick, pick, pick your jargon, um, 
uh, you know, I'm a lover of a metaphor, so I'll use another one. I, I kind of say like all the all the work that they're doing behind the scenes is is kind of like a, a dolphin, you know, it, it's below the surface and then it jumps back up. And you say, oh look, and then it goes down below the surface and it pops back up. And, you know, it's over there now. Um, for me, it's about having as many touch points as possible that sh that catch it when it's above the surface, and you join all of those little bits together to try and create a story of what happened while it was below. So you're trying to work with your publishers and your agencies and, and whatnot to try and say, well, how can we how can we create an opportunity for me to be able to see see him, uh, him or her when they come above above the surface again? So so long as you're aiming for that, you're trying to join your internal systems, you're trying to join every customer touch point, whether it's online, offline. You're trying to join your CRM. You're trying to join your you know in our world after sales, um, and then you're trying to join that through a research process after sales. You know before and after the purchase, trying to join all those together and you try and say, well, can I, can I create that single customer view so that I know everything about you when it's time to talk to you? And um, so my answer is no, but keep aiming for it. It's, I mean, it's, it very much is the goal. And I know we, we um, listening to Jordan before, we've got 187 people on the addressability uh, committee, 183 on accountability. Um, and so it's obviously a big imperative for the industry to help marketers have that single view. Um, but, you know, uh, Jordan, we might uh, throw to you now for your opinion. Um, you know, do you think, do you think this is actually uh, going to be uh, achievable? Um, can we all, you know, work together uh, to achieve, you know, the goals of a, a single customer view uh, for brands? Uh, okay, there's two levels of achievability, I think. The first is, is uh, for the industry to work together around getting any sort of addressability that enables a, even uh, a piece of the pie of the view. Uh, with, with what we see privacy engineers within the browser OS platforms doing by removing identifiers, it makes it difficult to get a view um, uh, of, of, of your customer as they uh, and their activity outside of, of, of specific uh, properties. Uh, and that, that is possible. I mean, uh, it, it comes together around standards and uh, there's either, there's one of two approaches. We either let uh, uh, a single uh, 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 very prominent first party uh, hold the keys to the kingdom, or we develop standards for addressability and accountability that enables um, all of us to contribute together towards the, that uh, identity that's necessary for that. Now, when you take that into uh, a single view, we will need to take that from the browser space and move this over to the mobile app space, the CTV space, to digital out of home, to a lot of these different areas. Um, and again, there, there is, uh, by, uh, by design, I think, uh, not by mistake, uh, you're seeing clean rooms assemble around uh, certain areas where they offer uh, that, but you don't have the clean rooms very well talking to each other. Um, and that is a next step. We are going, you know, and, and we do need to aim for that. And this is where the leading brands and the leading uh, publishers really need to lean forward uh, and demand that of, of the browser OS platforms uh, with uh, the regulators helping assist that it, in doing so in a right way that is right by consumers, but enabling that uh, uh, as well. And, and it is, it is going to be difficult, but we, do, we clearly need to aim in that direction. Thanks, Jordan. And I like how you highlight that, you know, other channels, particularly emerging channels, such as C um, uh, digital out of home uh, and also CTV, not as emerging. It's, um, uh, but, you know, they, these, these operate on a, a different identity model. Um, so that, that needs to be addressed as well, not just things which are uh, in browser, because that's the omni-channel um, view. Now, I, I also wanted to um, get Rashida's uh, opinion on this, uh, and it's all about uh, growing in logged in data. We hear a lot about growing a, uh, it being touted as probably the, the safest way to bolster your identity um, as, as a brand. But we also know that for, for many brands, they, they don't have a wealth of first party data, um, particularly from a logged in identifier, like an email or things like that. Um, Rashida, how are you solving for this, for, for brands that you're working with um, in, in your agency? 
Yeah, that you know that's totally right. Some brands are very lucky that they they were built in the online world and therefore they have access to that first party data that's very robust. Um, but for a lot of the brands that we work with, that's just not how they operate. So the way that we tend to work with brands, if we just start with what they have and then we try and build to improve on the resolution as we kind of go along. So it might be that we start with very basic um, CRM data. So some of the brands that we work with, they have a name and an address. Uh, and, and that's okay. We start with that. We kind of go, okay, well, we have access to your postcode data. What, what can we overlay that with? What can we enrich that with? Can we enrich that with the census data? Can we enrich that with some of the third party data partners that, that we work with? And how do we continue, I guess, to uh, improve the picture of the different audiences that we work with? When, when uh, some of our clients have no data, they, they sell to retailers and um, you know, the FMCG products tend to be very much in that space. Um, we start with their strategic audiences. What do we know about the people who buy your product from research? Uh, and we start small that way. And we, we kind of start from the qualitative data and then we go into quantitative and then we go through the same exercise of enrichment. So it's not about being perfect in terms of the identity resolution. It's about progressing and being less wrong and continuing to refine. Um, so then our brands better understand that the customers they're talking to. It's almost a refocusing on um, marketing best practice. Not that you guys weren't doing that already, but maybe a doubling down on that um, yeah. is only um, going to benefit the brands. Um, it's, there, and it's focusing on strategic partnerships. So are you, do you have other brands who are in um, adjacent categories that you have um, you know, strong affinity with that you can share data with and sort of enrich from one another? So it is kind of going back to very basic principles um, to, to aim up higher resolution, yeah. Thanks, Rashida. And I think we're seeing more of that um, uh, second party data sharing between two um, parties who are in agreement. Um, now, we're almost uh, out of time for the panel. Uh, I have one question which I'd like to throw to uh, Adele, and that's with third party cookies degrading, uh, will buyers be prepared to pay more um, to access a verified, you know, high quality uh, inventory with that identity attached or Will, they just, this, will this just guarantee more spend in the walled gardens or, or just to TV? Adele, what do you think on that? I, I think, you know, from an exchange's point of view, and, and I'm sure probably Rashida and, and the rest of the crew here would probably have a more insightful uh, idea in terms of what is actually the design in terms of what, you know, advertisers want to pay uh, in the long run. But, you know, I think when there is that that unique value exchange um, and knowing your audiences, there is a, there is a there is a really tangible value in that. So, you know, from the publisher point of view, um, which is I guess the lens that we bring in, in as one of the, the exchanges in the space, you know, they're looking at ensuring that the value exchange between the publisher and the end user is is strong enough that the user starts to feel confident that they can bring their data or enable their their um, you know unique data sets, uh, whether it's like age, gender, interest, intent, whatever it may be, uh, to be to be captured by these publishers and then to, you know, be leveraged by advertisers on the other end to create more meaningful advertising engagements with them. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, the, the time will time will tell us to to whether or not we'll see, you know, the the value represented correctly. I dare say in the immediate future, there's a massive period of adjustment that needs to happen. Uh, but I think in the end, like as an industry, we acknowledge that there is a real power in data um, yeah. and to, to find those, you know, really unique, highly intentful audiences is, is really strategic and valuable for many advertisers. And the publishers want to be able to, to enable that connection to happen. So I think the money will eventually uh, start to start to show and through, you know, better targeting comes better performance, better performance generates better ROI, you know, all of that sort of stuff feeds into it. And down the road, we will get to a point where there is that really explicit value exchange and the publishers and the advertisers see that there is, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit in the, in the people base world. Thanks Adele. So we're, um, we're out of time for the panel now, but we do have, uh, few questions. Um, firstly, thank you all to our panelists for joining uh, today. Uh, we're going to start with one question though, and that's actually for, uh, for Sam, if you'd like to, um, to jump back in here. 
Um, and that was uh, um, about uh, Sandbox, obviously. And, and the question was, who handles the auction uh, for, for Turtle Dove? Um, Sam, can you shed some, some light on, on what that means? Well, it, fundamentally, the, the browser does, it, although it's complicated. It, Turtle Dove uh, sends two ad requests. There's one ad request that they call the contextual ad request. And that is allowed to see the page URL and other contextually relevant information, but it's not allowed to see the retargeting information for the turtle dot retargeting data, for example. There's another ad request, which is meant to be purely uh, retargeting focused or audience based, which does see the retargeting turtle dot data. So those two ad requests are made separately. And then the browser conducts an auction with logic defined by some ad platform and a winner is elected and the ad is rendered. But it, more, more than to say, to answer that question directly, the answer is it's complicated and I don't think it's really finalized yet. There's a number of really fundamental problems with Turtle Dove. For example, anti-fraud is not exactly figured out in Turtle Dove. And I, I don't think they, that story has been written yet. <laughs>